Hi hey everyone, I'm um, Mel Edwards and this is Justin Barry, we're from Design Managers, which is what you've just heard. Um, so when we were invited to speak and we saw the themes about inspiring innovation and empowering people and liberating capability, we had just finished on a portion of work, um, an 18 month program of work working in the ATO, quite deep in the ATO in the ICT space. And we'd been working with them to shift their view from um, a delivery of technology products view to seeing themselves as enablers of service. And on reflection, we saw that it fit with all the things because it was about um, inspiring innovation, empowering people, and liberating capability. And it was both in practice and outcome an innovation program. Is coming up with innovation, which we've heard a lot of examples today and ways you can do it, and then there's making innovation work. And that's what we've been doing and that's what we continue to do with them and that's what we wanted to share with you today. So we have called this Innovation Two Perspectives because it's not just our perspective. We've worked with a really fantastic team at the ATO and in particular an assistant commissioner who's been quite inspiring as a design leader in the ICT space. And so we've got him, we interviewed him and, and he features today. So really fingers crossed that it's not a fail fast and that the video plays. So firstly, um, and a lot of stuff that we're going to talk about today is actually a reiteration of some of the things that you've already heard from Darren and John and, and Kate and even Jane at the beginning. So in terms of service design, the, the definition that, that we subscribe to is that it's a conscious and creative process. It's about crafting meaningful connections between users, their goals and their outcomes. So it's important to understand the different paths that people go through to achieve their goals and their outcomes. And when we talk about people, we mean users, customers, citizens, but we also mean staff, customers, call centre representatives, team leaders, decision makers. And the practice of service design is a, is a process driven practice. Um, it talks about clarifying intent, doing research, analysis, synthesis, prototyping, collaboration, iteration, all the actions you want. And you can Google all of those because they exist and they're not hard to find necessarily, but they are challenging to do. For us, service design is about delivering on need, not want, and particularly in the public sector where designing for a quality of experience is as, much, um, is as important as designing to enable a service resolution. And that's because quite often the, um, the person that uses your service doesn't have a choice, and the ATO is a pretty good example of where you don't have much choice who you interact with. Um, <clears throat> By definition, service design is an innovation process because it is a, a change process, um, but we also have a, an innovation definition that we subscribe to as well. And there's three key things in here that, that are quite resonant for us. It's about creating new forms of value, and it's about anticipating future demands and expectations. And the way we do that is by, as we've heard today from other speakers, understanding how people operate, what they think and what they do and what they use. Probably more important to us, in particular what we're talking about today, is the um, propelling of systemic change. And we, we don't actually believe anymore, having worked in government collectively for sort of 20 years each, well, total, sorry. Um, we don't believe in massive transformational programs. We don't believe they work, and something um, Steve Batty was talking about in terms of small work, we believe in what we call sticky steps, where you do small packages of work and you can't go back on what you've learned, you, you can't unlearn it because you've discovered it, and you move forward that way. And in this case study, that's what we've been able to experience. So now I'm going to uh, introduce you to Craig Fox. I am. And this is his take on innovation. You could spend all your time, um, you could spend all your time trying to work out what's the clever thing that I thought of that nobody else had thought of. Or you can say, actually, that's a pretty easy, that's a pretty easy problem to identify. The challenge is, how are we actually trying to try and fix it? So I, kind of, I, I think it's a really good part about innovation that don't go looking for the thing that nobody, you're not going to go and invent sliced bread again. You know, you're, you're just not. Mm -hmm. We put a man on the moon, that's been done. But that doesn't stop you being innovative with known problems. Mm -hmm. And I love design and I think the way to be innovative about known problems is to go back to design and intent. And then think about the way you want to implement that design, not the specifics of the recommendations of the design. So weird having Craig so big 
<laughs> he would love that. Um, so uh, what space are we talking about here? And, and I know that Craig's words, and you'll hear them throughout the presentation, he really um, brings designers like us back down to earth about practical application and implementation of the work that we do. We've just spent uh, a period of time um, down in Victoria working with maternity nurses around um, key ages and stages for bringing kids up from naught to four, and that's really sexy stuff. But this world, um, for some people it's sexy, but not the sexiest service design in the world, but crucially important. So the quote there, it's just a plastic box on a desk until there are services connected to it, is really was the starting point of an 18-month relationship um, of design projects with this group within ATO. So the group is the infrastructure service provision. Each of you from departments or even um, corporate groups would understand what we're talking about here. These are the guys who deliver the servers. These are the guys who make sure the phones are on the desk, They're the, the, when the printer appears. All of the catalogue in pattern, out of pattern, that pure ICT infrastructure uh, world that each of you interact with every day, that's the group we're working with in this sense. So from our point of view, it's as deep down in those service layers of service delivery as you can get. Um, and the program of work was all about connecting that to citizen um, outcomes. So we worked with them um, over a period of 18 months, and as Mel said, the way that we've done that is not to take off one huge question, but a series of six to eight rolling, six to eight week rolling design processes. And the reason we've done that is we don't know what the next design question is until we've delivered on one of those projects. And um, what I want to cut to now is Craig talking about that concept of a design question, which has driven our relationship, and as we call it in this work, not our client relationship, but our design partner relationship with this group. I hate this. I say to my people all the time, if we're having a conversation about the solution, how do we actually knew we had the right question to begin with? How do we know? What question are we trying to answer there? Well, I think you get the question right, and I think the answers are obvious, because there's only so many answers. What you then talk about is how you design an outcome to achieve that solution based on the environment that you live and work in and how you can kind of navigate your way through that. So I'm really big on question. I, I love something that says, do you understand what the question is here? Do you understand what the context is here? When you start to do that, you can get some very powerful design questions in there. Um, so what Craig's getting at there is that he lives in a world where, and you can use any terminology, vendors, consultants, specialists can come to him with a framework at any time. And he, he has pretty much seen every model or framework that you can see. Centralisation, decentralisation, insourcing, outsourcing. Um, it's, it's really interesting. And when he challenges us, he says, don't give me a model. I, I can Google a model and I can implement a model in my business. I can go about implementing that model as per the roles. Any agency can come here and tell me that I need, but that's not going to make this thing work. And so that's a very challenging um, and direct relationship that we have. Um, the way that we wanted to talk about uh, what the outcomes of this partnership have been is, is really around three key themes. Uh, one, um, and three key, key themes that for us have delivered real innovation in this case. Uh, one is about visualisation, which we've heard a lot about uh, this morning, but visualisation in order to understand the business that they're working in from a holistic point of view. Secondly is around that collaboration theme and developing and shaping options, but in this case, surprisingly for us, to create a, a quite a big paradigm shift for the business that they run. And finally, um, Tamil, um, dealing with challenges within the service system itself. So uh, these images are, are really uh, taken from the process that we've had over the period of time. The one in the middle um, looks kind of like a process map, but in its full form, it's an experience map and a visualisation of what our client, our partners, called an end-to-end -end process for delivery of ICT infrastructure. Pretty, pretty bland, um, boring title, but a fascinating piece of work going out and working with the business and all of their partners, stakeholders, whatever word you want to use, collaborators, to really map for them what this um, process looked like. Um, it's become known in, the, in this area of the tax office as the jelly baby model, um, and at first we were kind of is that an insult? We're not sure whether they're having a go at us, but it's become a terminology where um, they grab hold of that and they own this visualisation, and this has formed the basis of every other design project that we've done. So the, visual, the visualisation really became, um, because it's not a process map, the way we present it back with is all kinds of 
insights and synthesis of what we heard through the design process becomes about um, not what we say we do, because organisations are really good at saying what they think they do or what they tell people they do, but what we actually do. So this map was a representation including gaps, including big spaces where no one actually knew how millions of dollars of stuff was siphoning through a delivery system to present back to them. And that, of course, um, presents challenges in its own right. Um, because this worked really well because our focus wasn't to fix what they did. In this very first initial project, purely visualising and presenting back to them the system they were operating in was enough for the leaders and the band to SES to start asking critical questions about how they ran their business. And they, at that point in time, they didn't need external designers, even in a collaboration sense, telling them what they needed to fix it. Um, so, so that's really the key in terms of visualisation. What, what the band two responsible for the whole area said to us, um, and I'll read it so that I get it right, um, I've had this in my head, but it wasn't until I saw it expressed that I realised what it meant. And, and that was a critical breakthrough for us in terms of our relationship with them. The second thing is around um, some of the, the language that, that the people in the area use around us creating a paradigm shift in terms of collaborating with them. So each of these pieces of work are done with non-designers, um, with a range of disciplines. We firmly believe that service design, though it's a facilitating and driving innovation process and we fulfil that role as service designers, we respect and include all of the disciplines. You will never hear us say things like they're just a business analyst, they shouldn't be in the room. That voice of experience within the operating system is critical for real implementation and understanding what people know throughout that operating system. So the collaborative process was um, really important. Um, but one of the things about uh, this process for them in terms of collaboration is that um, ICT groups can very easily fall into the trap of becoming downstream providers. So you will hear ICT groups, much like marketing or communications groups in public sector offices, say, why aren't we represented on the table? Why can't we feed further up the chain? All of those phrases. But actually, some groups really don't mind just being a, the servant in the master servant and delivering on outputs and, and vendor outputs. So, this was really critical for us to challenge them around um, how they went about their work and what kind of intelligence they could bring to their work, not just fulfilling outsourcing requirements under contracts for the delivery of infrastructure services. You'll see the, the little um, box in the middle called IPO. When we first did this visualisation, it kind of occurred to us that that was one of the missing things that didn't exist. Um, when they saw the Jelly Baby diagram, they introduced an IPO on paper, which is an infrastructure portfolio office, managing their, their infrastructure through portfolio management arrangements makes sense, but they did it without any design. So one of the subsequent design projects that we did was to build that IPO in a very detailed design specification that they're still using now, but it wasn't what they thought it would be. Um, it was, it was um, much more about forecasting and planning than um, traditional portfolio arrangements. Spoken to you. Um, the final piece of work that um, we wanted to talk about in this example was where after we had done this work to talk about how, uh, how the end-to-end -end fits together and then we'd done this piece of work to say how this ICT group connected out to the business, the ICT group then said to us, okay, now we want to know how business can play a more active role. Now, ATO has deep ICT experience because um, its end users often know more than vendors because they have been around for 10, 15 years and sometimes the vendors cycle in and cycle out. A lot of taxation activity is outsourced to citizens, to taxpayers. If any of you are a small business, you know you have to do your bears yourself and you do that online sometimes. Um, and there's also a whole of government setting in terms of cost efficiencies and value for money. So the, the notion of ICT saying how can the business play a more active role, we knew already that this was not about us going back and saying this is what they should do to be more active. We knew that we had to present them with a challenge to reframe their view of things, not from an ICT-centric view, but from a view of themselves as a capability that presents opportunities to support the business for better ATO outcomes. So ICT helping to understand, helping to understand how the business operates and work with them, not be the box that will say, we'll do this, and then that's what you need, and then you carry on with your business. We were able to, through collaboration and activity and building on a lot of the work that we'd done and having the right questions, was um, describe an evolving roadmap for how the infrastructure could be better delivered with and for the business, because what we recommended was that it was treated like a service system, not as processes and templates and systems called Siebel and SAP and ATO Net, but with a clear line of sight from the, the, the tax agent that may ring up asking a compliance question to the person taking the call with a box on their desk with an application in it, 
all the way through to the person that makes sure that box is there or answers that help desk call because the box isn't working. This was a real challenge because this presented a new way of seeing their role and it had a detailed roadmap for change as well, but it became a catalyst for epiphanies, which was their word, for how they actually needed to change. They knew what they wanted to do, but we were saying you actually have to change in a slightly different way than you expected. And it is challenging presenting different views because we did in this instance hear of people wanting to throw our report across the room, but that's because it was challenging, not because it wasn't a good report. Um, now what we want to show you is just Craig's take on um, the chat, what happens when people start to think differently. And it says, particularly when for my guys, they start to understand, I'm not just trying to design a process to carry up a flow chart on a PowerPoint presentation, I'm actually trying to make it better to do things. Mm. All right, that's much more powerful. People start to think differently. So we've talked about um, the importance of context and the importance of question in this type of space. Environment is also critical, and in fact, John spoke about it a lot as well. So when we work with clients, this is how we see their organisation in layers, and it's probably familiar to you as well, and it's an echo of what Darren was talking about too. At the top, you've got customers. They've got their goals and their outcomes they need to achieve. They use touch points to do that. There's the service delivery capability delivered through operations. There's strategy and funding and discussions. And then, particularly in the public sector, we have the government layer, where there are citizens and there are ministers, and there's the media, and there's election cycles, and there's backdoor deals, and there's people making decisions because they want to get something done. That's just the way it works. And um, one of the things that we know about working in the public sector is having resilience, because you need to understand how to work in this environment and how to work with this environment, because you can't really change it on your own. We often hear, and we've heard today, about what we call the sexy side of innovation, where you really are working at the touch point level. You know about the rest of the organisation and how you've got to work with it, but it really is about how can I make a difference to, these, uh, to, the, to the citizen side of things. But what we know to make it stick is that the slide progresses. Isn't that your nightmare when you're presenting to a bunch of people? Okay, so we know to make innovation work, to make it stick, you have to address all of these layers. So what we bring to the table when we're doing this sort of work and what we demonstrate through practice, which is what um, Jane was talking about as well, is having a process, being clear about intent, having different ways of researching and working together, conceptualising and not solving the problem too quickly, which in the ICT space, everybody's got the problem solved before you even get in the room. So this was about getting them to work through what could be done. We have an unwavering commitment to seeing the systems as a service system because that's how you achieve a business outcome, through service systems. We also have the role to balance the, the jargon that occurs. We need to translate IT language into business language and business language into customer-centric language. And as Justin mentioned, we have to make sure that we're respectful of all the disciplines involved. We're successful in these instances because we know how to work in these complex environments and we love working in the public sector. We love knowing that sometimes an APS 6 has a decision making to do. But we also know that when you work with great leaders, they can make that environment work. And this is what Craig did for us. He understood how to make all these different layers work. And he also had this take. If I truly want to be innovative, have I created an environment to be innovative? Let's look at, at, at my world. I've got a bloke like Jeff Robinson who says, Craig, this is what you're going to do. I need someone to help fix some stuff. Fantastic. I then say to Jeff, I need these 10 people. Great conversation. Then I say, I need this imprimatur. Okay. I need to bring on board too, mate. Okay. So I think all of that is far more at good SES leaders' fingertips than what they think it is. Mm. If you want, as long as you are an understander of context, outcome, design, intent, and be able to articulate that in a way, you can then create the environment to be innovative. You've got no chance about being innovative if you can't create the right environment for it. You really can't. 
Um, so we wanted Craig's words to be really strong on that front because it's really important, we think, for a government audience, and we know there's a mixture of an audience here, but to hear the words from our client and not us around those kind of key things. Um, we've been lucky that he's done this and we'll finish up with just some um, quick reflections on what those two perspectives mean. For us, we were we've been lucky enough and continue to work with these guys who have a shared philosophy on innovation and design. Um, operate in an environment where difficult questions can be asked and respected once you <laughs> talk through what some of the difficult answers are. Um, and that um, our client doesn't treat design like a cliche. We've never, said, we've never had people in the tax office say we want one of those pretty pictures. They recognise there's a significant process behind that that leads to that, um, those kind of outputs. Um, from their perspective, they've had a robust process with service at the core, um, which seems unusual in an ICT context, but it's been a big turnaround for them to think of themselves as service deliverers, not just um, output deliverers. Um, service design outcomes and outputs help make sense of their world and they've had a platform for meaningful innovation. Um, so I know we're short on time, so we won't um, go much more on that, but we will give you one more Craig um, and we'll just hand over to him for the final words. So I, I think our most significant innovative change was an enterprise service management centre. It's pretty innovative, mm -hmm. pretty different. So we're actually not really focused on the innovative part of the model, we're actually focused on the innovative part of how to make the model work. It's just as exciting, it really is. Mm -hmm. But I think what some people do is they go, well that was, that was that big cathartic step, now what's the next big thing we go and do? And I go, well, it doesn't really matter. The more exciting bit is how you make that work. Mm -hmm. It's actually quite exciting. He looks weird, but he's excited, don't worry. <laughs> um, you didn't take a photo, did you? No. No, <laughs> good, because we won't show him how he looks in those videos. Um, so thank you for that. We hope um, you've um, taken something from that, pre something from that presentation. I'm happy to talk uh, during the breaks with anyone who has any questions. Thank you. Does anybody? <laughs>